Where to begin? Well, as more and more members of the Aussie online entrepreneurs community are building uh, six and seven figure online business, thanks to the information we teach and also, you know, the brilliant community we have here at the Aussie online entrepreneurs, I thought it was high time to get who I believe is the leading expert on legally paying less tax to come in and to talk to us, Mr. Andrew Anderson. And Andrew has been instrumental in my own tax strategy. So no doubt you're aware that I travel a lot uh, with my family and that currently I'm in Portugal. Well, that's all part of my own tax strategy. And I've been following Andrew for years now, and he's been instrumental in many of the decisions that we've made as a family about how we organize our lives and also are the countries that we're utilizing to set ourselves free. And we'll get Andrew to talk about that a little bit later on. And indeed, within my own particular lifestyle with my family, having multiple homes around the world, that comes from something that I originally heard from Andrew, which is something he calls flag theory, something that he'll talk a lot about tonight, no doubt. And also his, I'm going to call it a war cry to go where you're treated best. And that's, I believe, something that you'll hear a lot of tonight too. Mm. So tonight you're in for a treat. You truly, truly are. And here's why this is important. I absolutely love Australia, but it ain't cheap to live there. There's two types of taxes in Australia, the ones the government wants you to know about and the ones that the government does not want you to know about, the ones that they kind of slip underneath the radar. You know, GST, for instance, is a classic example of that. That's an extra 10% you pay to the government on everything you buy. Then if you like uh, a glass of wine, there's a tax for that. The car you drive, there's a tax for that. The fuel you put in your car, there's a tax for that too. The clothes you're wearing, there's a tax for that as well. And it goes on and on and on. And don't get me wrong, I'm all for paying my fair share. But what I'm not about is paying for dumb stuff and vanity projects and mistakes that the government does. I always really like that great quote from Kerry Packer when asked about his company's tax minimization strategies. He replied, of course, I am minimizing my tax. And if anybody in this country doesn't minimize their taxes, they want their heads looking at because as a government, I can tell you they ain't spending it that well that we should be donating extra. So it's with great excitement that I introduce you tonight to the boss of the Nomad Capitalists, the founder of the Nomad Capitalist, Mr. Andrew Henderson. Thanks so much for being with us, Andrew. Great to uh, great to be with you, and, and thank you for the kind introduction. Um, really excited. Well, I've had a, a lot of people ask me already. Whereabouts are you calling in from? I'm in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, which I think has been one of the best places to be these last three or four months. With um, a government that's very nice to deal with, very nice to foreigners, lots of consumer conveniences, very tax friendly, very affordable. Uh, so I'm in Kuala Lumpur. And um, notwithstanding what's currently happening with coronavirus and the kind of travel restrictions that happen, Andrew, how many days a year are you typically on the road? Well, really what I've been doing over the last couple years is building up my own personal uh, network of homes around the world. Actually, just before we uh, started this call, I was I was telling them to hurry it up because I wanted to make sure we were on time. I just closed on a uh, an apartment overlooking the parliament in, in Belgrade, Serbia, where I think it's a great place to hire people. I know people here are running businesses, one of the best places, in my opinion, to hire affordably. Um, and so, you know, my definition of on the road is shrinking. Uh, I'm doing a lot less travel. I've built up the team about two dozen people. So they're doing kind of the short term travel. But for me, it's mostly what I'm trying to do is just own homes in places around the world that I enjoy and go between those homes to where I'm really not on the road. Uh, but I like to spend, you know, four or five months a year in Kuala Lumpur. I like to spend, uh, let's call it three, maybe four months a year in emerging Europe. I like to slide through Latin America. I like to take a few vacations uh, or, or work trips through maybe, uh, you know, interesting places like a Tunisia or something like that. So, um, you know, it's really hard to say. But, you know, over the last uh, decade, 
it's been pretty nonstop. I mean, I think it was, uh, you know, 200 and some nights a year in hotels, probably 250 in hotels for a long time. Um, but now trying to trying to slow down a little bit. Yeah, well, the the recent um, marriage, of course, and congratulations to that. Well, not not so recent, but still, um, has probably curtailed your traveling lifestyle a little bit. Yeah, so actually, it's interesting. I uh, I got married legally on my wife's birthday. We did that because I didn't want it to be a thing, something we celebrated, and that'll be a, a year on uh, Sunday. Um, so, you know, I think I really got lucky. Uh, I knew that my wife, I knew that it was going the right direction when I asked her. I said, you know, I'd like to give birth to a child in Brazil so that way our child can be Brazilian. You know, what do you think about that? And she's like, no, I'm open to that. <laughs> and I never got a response before. So for a, a passport geek and a, and a guy like myself, I like that. Um, so you know, I think I was very honest up front. You know, here's what I want to do. Here's the life that, I, that I'm planning on living. She loves Malaysia, by the way, for people who are in the audience who are thinking, oh, it's a Muslim country or something. I mean, she's from Moscow where they're not super progressive compared to what maybe Australians are or, or Americans are. Um, you know, they, they have their certain stereotypes. She loves it. Uh, but we also travel around and, um, you know, I think it's just for me, getting married was kind of a reflection of wanting to be more settled. And so they kind of go together, the having of the homes, you know, you reach a point in business where, you know, you, you don't want to be bopping around in any part of your life anymore. So. We lost you unless it's just me. Anybody I'm here. Andrew? Oh, that's cool. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. All right. So here's kind of what we've got in store for you, Andrew. So I put out, of course, um, an email to my folks saying, hey, I've got this amazing guy, Andrew Anderson, coming onto the call. Let me know if you've got any questions for him. And of course, we were inundated with questions for you. But what tends to happen is, and you probably find this yourself, they were all around the similar kind of thing. And so what I've done is I've taken uh, the essence of each question for you uh, and put them into a little slide for you. So you can kind of um, answer the questions and go through some things. And then what I want to do towards the end as well, I want to talk a little bit more about Nomad Capitalist and how that can help people. Talk about your book, your YouTube channel, and how people can get in touch with you. So that's kind of be how we're going to be running things this evening, mate. And what I'll tell you to start off, because I I yes. know uh, you know you and I talk every once in a while. Here here's the here's the unfortunate thing about this stuff, right? There is no best place, and mm. we can get into some of the nuance of this. There's no number one. Yeah, you know, what's the best place to incorporate? I mean. You know, really depends. I know we're talking to a, a rather you know niche group of folks here who are in e-commerce. So we can talk about that, but I think that's the important factor. Uh, everyone gets to do this a little bit differently. Um, you can have one home and be a nomad capitalist. You can spend 365 days a year in one place and do what we're talking about. You can follow my trifecta method, live in three places. You can you can have a, a suitcase you drag around and stay in the hotels. Um, so there's no one best place. There's no one best country. There's no one best strategy. But we'll certainly dive into the things that you can think about at least and give you some pointers. Yeah, okay, I like that because you're right. It, it, it's gonna be greatly dictated by the individual. And uh, as I love to say, it always depends. All right, so with that little disclaimer being said, let's see if we can kind of get Andrew to, to uh, give us some great stuff. So here's from Kara. Typically, for most Australians looking to pay less tax, which country or countries do you suggest they go to? Well, I think you want to look at um, first the tax part, second the lifestyle part. You know, mm -hmm. what I can tell you is I do notice trends. Um, we work with people from all over the world, but largely Westerners. So I can look at Americans, Brits, and Australians as kind of people who follow certain trends. Um, Australians, in my experience, if they're going to come to a place like Malaysia, which I think is one of the easiest countries to immigrate to. If you're a business owner, it's very tax friendly. Um, they're going to look at a place like Penang rather than Kuala Lumpur, because I guess a lot of people in Australia, they like living near the beach. Kuala Lumpur is not near a good beach. Uh, so they might go and look at a place like Penang. Uh, they might also look at Thailand. Uh, I have a lot of folks who have gone there uh, because they want to live in one of the islands, that kind of thing. Uh, in Europe, 
I found that the is where you are, the Portugal vibe seems to work well um, mm -hmm. for, for, for the group. And so uh, those are three places that I think are good. I also think, you know, sometimes what's a nice idea is to set up shop in one place. It doesn't have to be permanent. You could get, you could get a, a MM2H in Malaysia, or you could set up your Portugal golden visa, or your Portugal freelancer visa, or whatever. Spend your six months there, lock yourself in for tax, take advantage of the low tax regime, and then go and commit to one month a year in six other places, two months a year uh, in three other places, and go to some of the more off-the-wall places. Go to where I think are good places. Go to the Georges. Go to the Montenegros. Go to the uh, Panamas. Go to the Mexicos that maybe are not as popular, but that are worth considering. And so, you know, what I try and do is it's really hard to convince someone to go to a place and, and commit to a place because there's this feeling of permanence that people have. So mm. if I say, hey, go and live in Georgia, that feels really weird. Um, it's happened before where I said, hey, this is the only country that works for your unique situation. Do it or don't. But generally, it's not the case. Uh, and so I think, you know, picking a place, doing the six months, perhaps, where you can lock in the benefits and then doing some exploration from there might not be a bad idea. And so you mentioned uh, a few different kind of Asian countries and Europe, Europe related areas as well. And so in the Americas, Mexico, Panama, there will be your kind of general Aussie kind of vibe picks. I think Panama has a lot of potential. Certainly you've got beach. I think Mexico is one of the hidden gems. Now, um, I don't know how much investment I'd be making there. I'm watching and looking what happens over the next uh, year and the elections that are happening there. Um, but I love, it's a place to spend time. I think it's fantastic. Uh, if you live in a place like Mexico City or in some of the coastal areas, there's actually pretty good English. It's actually, compared to what people say, it's pretty safe. You look at an area like Polanco in Mexico City or the, this, the town of Merida, which is a very well-organized and super safe town. I guess they say it's because some of the cartel's family lives there, so they keep it under wraps. Um, but uh, I think those are places to look at. I'm also a big fan of Colombia. Um, you know, there's some weirdness going on uh, in Colombia, but I think long term, I'm, I'm bullish. I'm talking like long term. Uh, I bought a house there last year and you can get a permanent residence by doing that. Not very tax friendly, but if it's one in the mix, that can work. I don't know if we're talking to more single people or more married people, perhaps it's more of a single person place. But um, yeah, I think uh, those are places that I like. Uruguay is interesting for families. It's pretty far down there. But I guess if you're coming from Australia, you can pop over to Chile and then right over to Uruguay. So those are ones that I like. Mm, that's absolutely, me and my wife and I were just talking about Mexico City. In fact, we're going right. there, given we were able to in uh, January to go and have a look around. So interesting probably that you mentioned the second that. second best city from my wife and I's perspective, probably in the top two in the world in terms of a city to be. Wow. Wow, okay, cool. Well, that's, that's heartening for sure. Let's continue on. David Simos. All right, here's quite a specifically unspecific question. How does Greece rate as a place to live and work compared to Australia? It's the easiest foreign passport for me to obtain. So I, I, what I would imagine what David's talking about is in terms of getting a foreign passport is he has some Greek ancestors. Uh, and I've seen that's the case, yeah. I've, and I've seen that. We've actually, I think most of the cases we've done, I haven't done that many, but they've been uh, Australians who uh, were from Greek ancestry or even moved there as a child. Uh, and so there's a difference between where you get a citizenship and where you live. And quite frankly, it might not be a bad idea to totally separate them. So, for example, I live in Malaysia. I can leave anytime I want right now. Mm. Uh, and I get treated very well. But in Asia, they're a bit more tough with their own citizens, and their citizens right now cannot leave. And so, you know, my perspective is if you have the ability to live in Malaysia for the rest of your life on some other passport, that's what I would do. You're not going to become a Malaysian citizen. And as much as I think it would be kind of cool because I love the country, I, I don't think I'd want it. I'd like to be a permanent resident, what have you. So if you apply that same strategy, you know, you could be a Greek citizen. I would take that as a second passport because I think that Australia – and or the EU in the next 10 years might start taxing their citizens extraterritorially like the way the US does now. So at least you can hedge your bets having two good passports. But uh, yeah, Greece, probably equivalent in many ways to Australia, high tax, lots of regulations. Uh, I would not live there now. They have uh, a flat tax program. We don't really deal with that too much because it's just not so workable. Um, I 
don't know actually if that applies to Greek citizens, but you can go and pay 100,000 euros a year basically, same that Italy has. Um, but uh, uh, what I would do is I would become a Greek citizen and I'd go live somewhere else. And being an EU citizen means you can go and live in Portugal without making an investment, without jumping through the hoops. You just go and register and then you can mm. qualify for any other country's tax exemption. So, um, I mean, Greece is one of those countries where they're very tax uh, heavy. And if you want to spend a couple months a year there, that's fine. But once you start to make it your center of life, they're going to come after you with uh, guns blazing. So I would either use that Greek passport as a hedge against an Australian passport and some of the future taxes that I think are be going to be coming up on expats in the coming 10 years, basically giving you more than one option. And I would live somewhere else on that one. Uh, and if you wanted to use that again to facilitate an EU residence, it makes it a bit easier. So let's just let's just quickly talk about that because there may be uh, people on the call that don't really realize what's happening in the world as far as uh, citizen-based taxation is happening, and they may not be fully up to speed with the fact that America chases you around the world, Canada now chases you around the world, and it probably looks like Australia is going to pursue that too. Can you just talk about what that is and, and where you see that going? Well, Canada, I, I brought, I talked about this a couple months ago. There's a member of parliament who wants to do it, uh, the same thing that they do in the U.S. Right now, the United States is essentially the only country that um, forces its citizens, no matter where they live, to pay tax and to file taxes, uh, no matter where you live. Now, if you're an entrepreneur, as our group is, you have a lot of flexibility. You can pay yourself a salary and you can take the first $107,600 tax-free plus a deduction. So you can make about 10,000 US dollars a month as a US citizen overseas. And if you structure your business in a foreign corporation, then that's basically free of all tax whatsoever. Above that, it gets more tricky. Trump made it more difficult in 2017 with his new tax reform to where now there's a lot more rules. Most people who live overseas are still going to be required to pay 10 or 15% to the United States. Uh, so if you make a million dollars a year, you're going to still be paying hundred grand a year in tax, even if you don't spend a single day living in the United States, merely because you have a U.S. passport. And then people say, oh, I'll get a second passport. No, you're still a U.S. citizen. You could have a hundred other passports. As long as you're a U.S. citizen, you're also required to file reports on all of your foreign corporations, uh, you know, detailed reports on money in, money out, what's going on, has to be done to U.S. accounting standards, which oftentimes gets complicated. I've had people who are Americans living in Australia. They have a nightmare sometimes. You've got to report your foreign bank accounts. And if you don't, if you miss one, they can take half the value of your account. Uh, so I had a guy recently who's been living in London as an employee. Hardly the kind of guy dodging taxes. He's paying plenty of taxes being an employee in London. But nobody told him he had to file his UK bank accounts for the last 12 years. And we're now fighting to make sure he does not have a half a million dollar penalty for not doing that because he never knew. So my theory, reading stuff from the OECD and other groups, is that this will be happening in other developed countries, perhaps the EU as a block, perhaps specific EU countries that's been talked about in France. Canada's talked about it. I think Australia is probably the one country that's as aggressive on this kind of stuff as the US in principle. They might be doing it. And so really what I've said is have a second passport. If you can get one as good as Greece, fantastic. If not, get something worse, get Colombia, get Mexico, get whatever, and have it as an insurance policy that the day um, that they come for you. Because I'll tell you what happened. On November 4th in the US, I believe, 2017, they said, hey, all this chatter of tax reform is finally happening. And they basically locked you in and said, you know what? Whatever you do from here on out doesn't matter anymore. We're going to look retroactively. So that way, basically, they just woke up one day and said, you know what? Going forward, here's what your foreign companies are going to do. You're going to pay us 15.5% of any retained earnings. If you've banked a million dollars in profit, you send us 15.5% of that. And now it's wow. too late. You can't get out of it because today is the day. They passed the law right before Christmas uh, of the same year. So it took them six weeks to get it done. But the point is, you know, there was murmuring. There was rumblings of that for some time. You could have gotten out of Dodge, but not if you didn't have another residence, not if you didn't have another passport. Will Australia do that? I don't know. Uh, but they are also broke and they also need the money. And uh, what we know is people who live overseas in Dubai or in Malaysia, not paying any taxes, are not a very difficult group of people to, uh, to uh, demonize in politics. That's exactly right. Everybody likes to go after that particular group of people, wealthy overseas people. Yeah. 
All right, that's maybe, hopefully that's giving you something to think about on the call. This is what's happening in one country. As Andrew said, Australia, they are equally aggressive, although there's nothing in place yet. It certainly could happen. Certainly something to think about. All right, so next question comes from Gillian. Okay, interesting question. How many months per year do you have to live outside of Australia to make this work? And this, I would assume, means not being uh, subject to Australia's tax rules. Yeah, I mean, the answer, again, is it depends. I would generally say three or four months. I would generally say if you're going to max it out, you probably don't want to do it all in one stretch. That's a problem for, like, Canadians, for example, because unlike you guys who have such a you know beautiful country, you know, the Canadians, you don't, you're not going there in December, right? So it's it kind of, you know, in Canada, you spend four months in the summer there, that kind of looks bad. You know, same thing in Australia. Four months to me is probably the limit. Three months is more comfortable. You know, if you're if you're getting closer to that limit, I would spread it out, kind of one month here, two months there, kind of thing. There's a lot of factors that get involved. It depends on what your connections are to Australia. So what I call it is is scorched earth versus scalpel. For me, when I left the United States, it wasn't even a t people don't people don't even understand this. My leaving the United States was really not a tax issue. The taxes were the happy coincidence, and I've turned that into a business, having figured it out. I just didn't want to live there. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I did keep bank accounts, but I sold my house. I mean, I closed everything. I wanted nothing to do with the place. Obviously, some people, they want to do the scalpel approach. You know, my approach was the scorched earth. Some people say, well, can I keep my house? Yeah, if you rent it. Well, can I Airbnb it? Eh, that looks kind of bad, right? So it's like the more that you're trying to cling on to Australia, the more evidence you're leaving. There was a guy who was out of Australia. He was coming back, I guess, I don't know, a couple months a year. So he was meeting all the criteria except for one thing. He never canceled the um, the slip in the marina. He was renting a place to park a boat. Now, he took the boat with him, but he was continuing to pay rent for this place in the marina. And the ATO came back and said, well, uh, we, uh, we, we figure that's evidence you're coming back someday because why would you keep paying rent on a place to park your boat if you were never coming back? So we're going to go back however many years it was and tax you as if you never left. And so wow. the more of those wow. things that you leave for them to claw after, the easier it is. Uh, I'm not saying you can never come back. I'm not saying you have to give up your citizenship, but there's this idea that is still perpetrated where there's the 183 day rule. And as long as you spend one day less, you're fine. No, it is one of multiple tests. There's four main tests in Australia. Um, that is only one of them. Basically, it means if you do spend 183 days, you're screwed. If you spend 182, they will surely find something to hang their hat on that that is your center of life, right? right. Because, I mean, where else, could you be, where else can you be spending more time, right? So they've come up with all these different other rules. You know, where's your center of life? Where's your principal abode? You know, where's your, where's your domicile? So all the, and if you're from Australia, then they just figure like, the DAC is stuck against you, right? If I spent 182 days in Australia, maybe I would have a small fighting chance because uh, I'm not from there. But if you're from there, uh, I'm thinking three months. Hmm. So just to just to clarify that then, uh, so spending three months of the year in Australia would be, if you're trying to live this kind of lifestyle, three months of the year in Australia is about the maximum you you can or could do and still claim that you don't have you know, your center of life there, your nexus is there. Uh, it it really depends on where else you are. Do you have a tax treaty? Do you have a closer connection somewhere else? You know, do you, if you're a, like if you're, if you're, let's say you're doing the Greece thing, for example, if you're a Greek citizen living in Greece, that's fine. Sometimes, you know, I mean, if you're living in a more substantial country, like again, Portugal kind of works because people think of it as a substantial country. So there's, there's really a ton of factors. And part of it comes down to just kind of a feeling also. Sometimes it's, you know, I always tell people, you almost have to act as if, right? Because if you're like cutting corners and like, all right, you know, I'm just going to take six months vacation every year, you're going to be acting as if you are an Australian resident. And they're, they're basically going to pick up on that. You know, it's kind of an energetic thing almost. But uh, I think three months with some caveats of other factors are involved. I think that's a comfortable number for most people. All right. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Next one from Kate. This is a very, very topical question, given what's going on 
in Hong Kong right now. So Kate says, I live in Hong Kong. With the new changes here, I am reluctant to set up a business here. What's your thoughts mm -hmm. on the current state of play and where things are going to go, Andrew? Well, this is, I know, Neil, you post your comments. People people send you their, you know, snarky and nasty remarks, and you always revel in them, which I, I enjoy reading. You know, one of the, the kind of the stock criticisms that people like to throw out on social media is, this won't age well, right? That's like the, they copy each other's uh, hate uh, you know, posts. Uh, and so I put out a video back in, I think, December, where I said, I am still not giving up on Hong Kong. And now I imagine some people, as it kind of, this new developments happen, will be saying this won't age well. Yes. Um, here's, my, here's my position on Hong Kong. I've never said to live in Hong Kong. No, I have people that I work with who do live in Hong Kong and they plan to keep living there. I'm not telling you whether you should live there or not. That's a personal decision. Certainly it's a relatively tax friendly country if you have any kind of investments or business outside of Hong Kong. Um, here's what I would say on Hong Kong companies. In the world of offshore companies, you want a reputable jurisdiction. So the Seychelles, the Belize, the Marshall Islands, those are pretty much trashed at this point. Nobody respects them. You're not going to get a bank account. You're not going to be able to move money. You may get yourself into trouble with whatever it is you're living. So Hong Kong still has a reputation. The backing of China, I think, actually bodes well for it because other jurisdictions with similar um, zero tax programs have been bullied into submission. They have not. Uh, and so what I tell you to look at is your offshore company is a flag of convenience. Now, what, what maybe I'm picking up on here is I live in Hong Kong, therefore I should incorporate in Hong Kong. Not necessarily. And by the way, if you live there, you can't pay zero tax. If you're a Hong Kong resident, you, you do not avail yourself of the zero tax exemption. You've got to pay from eight and a quarter to 16 and a half percent. But, um, you know, I think of like a cruise ship. You ever take a cruise and you're on the ship? I think like Liberia is one of the, the common flags for cruise ships. Anyone ever want to take a cruise to Liberia? Does that cruise ship ever go to Liberia? No, they pick the, they pick the country, let them do whatever the hell they want <laughs> while they're sailing the high seas and they stuck the flag on the side of the ship. And that's kind of how I look at an offshore uh, company. As long as the offshore company plays nice with the other things happening in your personal life, um, you, don't have, you can have a company in Hong Kong, take advantage of their very friendly rules, take advantage of their reputation. You do not have to bank there, for example. You can go and use that company to open bank accounts in other countries. Uh, now, if you're again, if you're living in Hong Kong, you're a Hong Kong resident. I might not incorporate there if your goal is tax reduction, because um, again, top rate of 16 and a half percent, you can do much better. Um, but you know that it's not a bad place to go. I'm not anti Hong Kong, and I know it seems odd, um, but you know, the UAE is maybe a, another jurisdiction, but the UAE is more expensive than Hong Kong. So if I'm just starting out, I've got a guy right now, he has not started his business yet. He's sold a business, he's got sitting at a few million dollars and he wants to keep it affordable. So you're gonna spend less to set up in Hong Kong. And so for that reason, you can bank somewhere else and you kind of have some diversification. Here's my other thing in Hong Kong, by the way. You know, where I come from the US, if you haven't noticed, it's burning to the ground right now. And yet everyone I know is staying there and saying, hey, if it gets bad enough, we'll leave. 293 cities had riots with fires and burning and protests and looting and windows smashed. I don't know how much worse it can get. Yet those exact same people will point to Hong Kong and say, that place is terrible. It's fallen off a cliff. Hmm. I don't think that the business right now is the issue. And so I, I don't take my cues from the Western media on which places are, 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 are great and which are not. So do you ultimately feel then that the, the the China's influence will extend in the same sort of way to the influence it has over Macau, for instance, and they'll just kind of let it do its own thing whilst bringing it into their sphere of influence? You know, I'm not, I'm not a great prognosticator. Uh, maybe. Uh, I, I can certainly see that happening. Listen, you know, you know what the Chinese are great at and what China's done a great job of is, is being very pragmatic in how they're building their empire mm. um, you know in many ways china is a more capitalist country than many western countries i know it sounds very odd to say um obviously a lot of the personal stuff is is concerning uh, in terms of a flag of convenience uh, i i you know if it concerns you then maybe it's worth paying a little bit more and going to some other jurisdictions but what i'm saying is i wouldn't rule it out for that reason um and and yeah i think it's quite i mean i do think that their their goal is to make shanghai more more prevalent um 
but I, I also think, again, uh, having the backing of a country like China means that you're not some tiny island that gets pushed around because how many people who've been doing the Belize offshore company with a bank account in Dominica have had bank account after bank account after bank account closed, frozen, moved, paid out in, you know, Belize dollars. I mean, you know, having some heft behind you is not a bad thing. Mm, I like that. That's a very different way of thinking about it. Very, very different. I like that. All right, let's next one. This one's from Jeff. <laughs> uh, which country would be your number one pick to live in for all round lifestyle and tax purposes? Right. So if are we setting the parameters that it's one country for, for 365 days a year and that it has That's to be right. tax friendly and good for lifestyle? Yeah, let's go for that. Let's give you let's yeah. give you a challenge. Because again, obviously you can you could just you know split your time up between different places and, and kind of fly under there more. Because I'll like just to be clear. Australia is the, the tax rules in Australia are some of the most aggressive. These Western countries have some of the most aggressive. If you go to Montenegro and spend 182 days out of a 183 day test, they said you didn't fail that we had one test, you passed it, right? We don't leave, we'll leave you alone, right? The Western countries have gotten more aggressive. So, one country, well, I mean, I believe that we vote with our feet. And so, for me to sit here and say anything other than what I'm doing, I guess, would be uh, disingenuous. I would say I would choose Malaysia. Mm. Why Malaysia? What is it about Malaysia that, that is appealing to you? Well, number one, I think you have some of the most friendly people in the world. My wife has really pointed that out since she started coming here almost two years ago with me. Um, particularly, the, there's there's three different main ethnic groups here. There's the Malays, whom are the Muslims. They're in government. There's Chinese, who pretty much rule the business world. And then there's Indians. So for me, coming from the U.S., you know, having different cultures for me is a good thing. Uh, the Malays in particular are super laid back, super friendly. I think that kind of permeates since they're the ones in charge that permeates everything. You know, I had to go to the police station uh, to pick it, to get a, a, a police report for some lost documents. And, uh, you know, being from the U.S., I braced myself for misery and being shattered at and everything. And it's quite pleasant, actually. Every every part of bureaucracy here, from my perspective, may not be the most efficient, but it's very pleasant. Everyone's mm. very pleasant. People in the in the places where you would live speak pretty good English. You have every consumer convenience that you can imagine. I can look out my window and see, uh, you know, two different Prada stores, Louis Vuitton stores. I have every kind of Western grocery store you can imagine. Um, you have great weather, of course. You have. Uh, I was I was about to fly to Serbia. I was about to book my ticket tonight, and now they're talking about locking down Belgrade again. And so, uh, you know what I, I told my team? I said, hey, at least I have beaches, I have islands, I have big cities, I have old colonial outposts, I have jungle retreats. I mean, there's so many things that you can do in one country. Um, so I think for that reason, it's uh, it's really up there. It's very tax friendly, easy country to immigrate to. I guess number two would be Mexico, but the tax laws there are a bit more ambiguous. Um, but I think Malaysia is great. And again, coming from, from Australia, I think people probably feel pretty comfortable with it. Very easy to travel in and out of. Um, so. Yeah, I think that's, that's good. Thank you for that. All right, so just, just so you know, folks on the call, um, asking a super specific question, whilst that may, may be great, I, it's unlikely that we're gonna be able to get Andrew to give you any kind of specific um, tax or legal based advice um, that's probably better off done within a one-on-one -on -one consult with Andrew so that he can really understand your unique situation uh, we'll talk about how you can do that later on but uh, but I would suggest to you that that would be a better way to approach that rather than asking a rather than on a kind of in a forum like this where Andrew's not going to be able to ask the right kind of questions to you so he can best understand your unique situation financial situation lifestyle situation etc and give you mega mega specific advice that's better off done in a one-on-one -on -one consult with andrew and we can talk about that later on would you agree with that andrew yeah i mean so every tuesday i, I basically go nuts and i'll spend about 15 hours working with folks uh doing our calls and we have what's called the clarity call which is the second out of the fourth or fifth call in a whole chain um and generally we'll put together a list of about a hundred and 70 to 200 questions in about 10 different categories 
Uh, and so it really comes down to questions as specific as what's your highest level of education completed? Because in some countries, if you want to incorporate, you need a bachelor's degree or you need a director who does have one. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, where are your employees? I mean, so yeah, I, that's what we do to cover it. And then generally what we'll do on a, on a, on a, on follow-up call or calls is, you know, additional scenarios, follow-up questions. Can you clarify this? Um, now I suppose I'm probably the most robust at this from what I've seen. Most people are just, you know, answer two questions, Belize, Bob's your uncle. There you go. But I mean, to cover the holistic approach, yeah, I, mean, I think it's it's 200 plus questions. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. All right, so next one from Amro. Um, here's the question: Can I sell my Australian company? I assume that's a PTY LTD company to another company overseas. So I sell the shares in the company. I suspect that's what I mean. That I also own in a country that has a has a lower tax threshold. Well, I'm not sure what we're trying to accomplish here. I mean, you, you, sure, you can do that. The question is, will there be a tax benefit, right? So, I mean, the first mm -hmm. thing I tell people, and let's just get this out of the way uh, to clear up any confusion. I mean, if you're going to live in a country, Australia, the U.S., Canada, et cetera, and you're going to have a foreign corporation, you can do that. And uh, that could work for asset protection, for example. You know, in the United States, everyone's suing everybody. So if you have your company offshore, you have your trust offshore, that gives you protection for your non-local assets. Um, but it's not going to save you any money on tax. So I had a couple recently in the U.S. They said, oh, you know, we're well covered. We have, our, we have you know, five million in Panama as long as we don't take it out. I said, what are you talking about as long as you don't take it out? Who's giving you tax advice? Oh, we hired a tax attorney. Who? I want to know who. It, as long it, these are these are not countries with what's what's called remittance-based tax systems. You know, if you're living in Australia and you accumulate money offshore, you're going to pay as if it were an Australian company. Uh, mm -hmm. So, can you sell the shares? You can. Now, typically, what happens when someone has built up an existing business uh, living in Australia and you want to then move it offshore? Uh, this is an area that's kind of hard to comment on specifically, but sometimes you will need to sell some of those assets if there's intellectual property that will need to be sold. I very rarely see where your people are paying boatloads of tax, but we've had, we've had it where someone's selling a huge business that's very Australia focused, and we've got to basically sell it offshore. You know, sell it as a residence, we get that that capital gains tax discount, uh, and then now the business is offshore, and now whatever else we accumulate, uh, you know, works. So you know. You, Yes, you can. Other times, by the way, like a business like mine, maybe now I would need to sell it. But a couple of years ago, it's me and a couple of other people. You know, the answer is if I quit the business, what's it worth? It's mm -hmm. worth nothing. The business falls apart. So maybe there's not much to sell and you can pretty much just move it and just do the paperwork. Um, so you can do that. Absolutely. Um, but understand that uh, just a, a one man business with the one man being in, in Australia is not going to help you. Google and, and people can do that more more easily because they have structures all over the world. Um, so I hope, does that answer the question, Neil? I believe so, yeah. So does that then imply uh, for folks who are, let's say folks at the beginning of their entrepreneurial journey, because I know, I know we've got a few folks on the call who are definitely at the beginning of their entrepreneurial journey, that right. it, it may be more prudent for them to set up um, their company in an offshore jurisdiction now rather than try to move it later is that tends does that tend to be the, the yeah well so from a purely financial perspective yes now you know me people watch my stuff i'm very much into you know the success mindset and i realize it's like for anything in personal finance it's 20 percent head knowledge and 80 percent behavior the behavior generally is unless you just sold your last company for 20 million dollars and you're you're wealthy and you're starting a new one and you want to do it properly most people are going to figure hey i can do that later yeah. And so you should do it when you feel the urge to do it, when there's a pain. And that's why I've got some people right now who have just moved to a new country, like, like the guy moved to the U.S. He's making a lot of money and he hasn't felt the pain of sending the IRS a million dollars yet. So he's not too worried. He thinks everything's fantastic. He thinks he's untouchable because the bill hasn't come yet. Mm. Um, but yes, if I'm starting a business from a purely financial perspective, not a human perspective, yeah, I would recommend you do that. And I would even recommend that even if you're going to stay in Australia for a little bit longer, maybe you set it up as just like a CFC, a controlled foreign corporation first, run it that way, pay your dues in Australia, and then at least you're ahead of the game 
you know, or, in an organizational manner, right? At least you can procedurally um, just, you don't have to be migrating everything later. Um, what I also tell people is, you know, Australia, if you have certain assets, can tax you on your exit. And so uh, before you accumulate too much, uh, you want to move. I mean, for me, you know, uh, where I come from, the United States, the issue, since they have this worldwide taxation, is, is an extra step past what most Australians are going to do, which is you've got to give up your citizenship if you want to be totally out of there. And basically what they say is if you have over $2 million in assets, we're going to sell it all and we're going to tax you. Australia has a similar provision on certain assets when you become taxed on residents. So the goal is not to build up some gargantuan business, move overseas and sell it the next day. That's not really going to help you. You want to get ahead of it as much as you can. Mm. So planning is key then, knowing knowing where you're trying to get to and putting the structure in place to facilitate that now rather than later. Yeah, absolutely. And, and also just doing the actual hard work of um, physically relocating. Um, because again, you, you can't just, you know, there's two things you can't do. Number one, you can't just move overseas tomorrow, sell the whole business, and suddenly it's as if nothing ever happened in Australia. Uh, the other thing you can't do is go overseas and then retroactively cancel out your taxes. You know, I've had some people from Australia call me and like, hey, what can I do to move, you know, in September to not pay any tax for this year? Um, not a lot. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of, the ship's kind of sailed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, lots and lots of brilliant comments coming in. Um, I'll, I'll read some of those out for you later, Andrew, but you know, you're, you're wiring them, mate, for sure. Okay, so next question. So uh, Joe says, what have you learned from consulting with seven and eight figure entrepreneurs that are great business lessons? So clearly, you know, you talk to a lot of very wealthy people. What are some, some of the things that you've learned from them? Yeah, I mean, we work with everybody from people who are, you know, just starting out. You know, we have a day trader making $400,000 a year and 22 years old up to, you know, a couple multi-billionaires. And so everything in between. Uh, I like, I mean, I love working with all of them because I love the chance to mentor uh, younger people. And so talking to a 22-year-old who once who says, hey, you know, what would you do if you were 22 is great. Um, but on the higher level, I love it because what have I learned? Uh, number one, uh, they are essentially all builders, not hustlers. And so, you know, they are doing something for the long term. I've got a guy who's originally from Australia. He's been in the uh, mining and metals business for almost 40 years. I mean, huge net worth, but he's stuck with it and he keeps building and he never, he keeps getting offers to sell it and they don't, he's like, well, I'll sell it, but he can't bear to do it because he loves it so much, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I, I don't see many people at the 50 or $100 million level doing is, you know, building an affiliate website, uh, you know, spamming links or doing some trick or, you know, beating their chest. And then a year and a half later, it collapses because Google algorithm changed and they don't know what to do. They're doing things that they love doing that's sustainable. So it's what you guys are doing with e-commerce where it's building a brand. It's not, you know, hawking some tchotchkes that you took off the back of a truck on a Facebook ad and two weeks later, you're on to the next thing. I mean, it's that. They're also extremely ethical. And I grew up around this. My father's the most honest guy. Now he beat this into my head like you wouldn't believe. Um, but they're also highly ethical, which is very interesting when you hear what people are talking about in the Western cultures these days. You would think they're the most disgusting people on the planet, but they are the ones who follow through on their word. And that's been inspiring to me to feel more confident in my ability to do that uh, and to be outwardly um, you know, a proponent of that. Um, those, I think, are, are two of the big things. Uh, certainly some of them have certain habits, have certain regimens. I'm not as regimented, although, um, you know, I, I've started being more regimented, just admitting, you know, I don't wake up early, that kind of thing. But um, I think those are two big things. I'm sure I could I could come up with many more over the course of time, but I think those are two important ones. And clearly you've shown a lot of discipline, even just in as much as the amount of travel that you've done over such a sustained amount of time. That that demonstrates well, that an incredible is, amount of discipline. That, well, thank you. That is the other thing. Uh, is and it sounds so cliche, and everyone talks about it, you know, hustle and grind. But they did it. And you know, it's fascinating. I again, I'm, I'll be 36 in October, and I'm kind of just figuring this out at a soul level. 
when I go to do things, for example, like today, you know, closing the house, and of course there's 500 euros in charges that weren't disclosed because someone forgot. And I ask myself, is nobody proactive? The answer is almost no. Does anybody mm -hmm. think ahead? The answer is almost nobody. Most mm -hmm. people go through life letting life wash over them like a tidal wave. You know, I mean, I mean there's, there was a radio show host that I um, back in the day in the U.S. and people would call up and they'd be like, hey, I got my girlfriend pregnant. He's like, how did that happen? I don't know. It just happened. <laughs> right. And it, you know, this is how most people approach life. And so there's a high level of intentionality. Um, and it's been great to be around these people because I think I've increased my level of, inten of intentionality, you know, doing things for intentional reasons. And to me, that speaks so much to what we talk about. There was a guy on our Facebook the other day. Uh, he said, Mel Melbourne, you know, best city. I hope I'm not offending the other people from other cities, but he said, best city in Australia, you know, best city in the best country on earth. And I said, hey, I'm, you know, I'm glad you found something that works for you. And I mean that. If you have gone through and said, you know what, it's worth 50% tax. I love everything here. I love the dating culture. I love the social culture. I love the food. I love the, the government. If, it, if, if that's what serves you, I'm not here. It's go where you're treated best, not go where you pay the least. Hmm. Um, but most people are sitting around. They're not living intentionally. It's just what they know. They've been told to fear. I had a friend in Australia once that we're told if we're from Melbourne to invest in Sydney is, is certain death. You know, like you're going to lose all your money and be fleeced. I mean, imagine what it's like to go and live in Portugal. So that's mm. not living intentionally. And I think these people have made very big action oriented decisions and they've done so intentionally. Mm. How interesting. I love that. All right. Uh, this is the last question that I've got for you. And then um, I want to talk about how people can get mm. some more information from you. Okay. So uh, a lot of oftentimes we are told uh, within the Amazon community that to sell from Australia in other countries such as America, the best thing we can do is get a US based LLC, whether that's a Wyoming or a Delaware Corp or whatever it may be. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there any tax advantages to that? Like, how do you see that playing out? If you structure it properly with the e-commerce, you are shipping physical goods. So there's a lot of planning steps to, to go through. Uh, so US LLCs for like what I do, very tax efficient. If you're not a US citizen, if you're not a permanent resident, if you don't spend substantial time in the US, if you don't have staff in the US, offices in the US, fulfillment centers like warehouses, I'm not talking about Amazon fulfillment, I'm talking about your own warehouse. There's a lot of boxes to check there, but US LLCs, you mentioned corporations, that's a whole different animal. Those are not very tax efficient. U.S. LLCs can be tax efficient if you are not a U.S. person and if your company is not really doing business in the U.S. The challenge that we, we have to work around more specifically with shipping stuff physically there is there's a thing where there's what's called like a transfer of custody because um, you're shipping a physical good. Um, and if that happens within the U.S. and it's more difficult, if it's happening from out of the U.S., i.e., you know, you're shipping it from China, um, then that's less difficult. Um, so U.S. companies are fine. U.S. companies can also be part of a general overall offshore structure, like with subsidiaries. Um, so e-commerce, there are some more things to check, but make sure. I, th I think Stripe Atlas, for example, some people like the Stripe service. I, I believe, maybe they just changed this recently. I think they might offer both now. But for the longest time, they offered a U.S. corporation. Uh, no mm -hmm. buenas dias on that. Uh, Wyoming and Delaware are popular. I don't care for them as much, uh, merely because uh, they are uh, they don't disclose you know readily the owners, and people think oh it's a great thing nobody will know who I am. Well, believe me, if someone wants to sue you, they're going to find out who you are. The U.S. government will certainly find out who you are. And so what 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 happens is if you ever want to send money overseas to yourself or to a related company or to a to a parent company or a subsidiary or whatever, uh, you're going to get more questions. It's going to be harder to prove that it's a related party transaction um, uh, to certain banks along the uh, the food chain. Uh, so I like to look at other states that are a bit more open where your name is out there and anybody can go look into it for the reasons of operational efficiency. And this is one of those areas, Neil, where you know tax guys are like, well, what does that matter? It's like, well, because I'm out here actually doing it and I've had banks hold up transactions uh, for that very issue, and I've seen it, right? It's an operational issue, not a tax issue. Um, I would not go in the form in, in California or New York, um, 
And I think Wyoming and Delaware, while fine, could pose some operational issues. They also might not, by the way, um, but I've seen them pose those issues. So um, I think that covers kind of a couple facets that are involved there. That's one of the things I really like about the advice and the information you give, Andrew, is that there's a deeper understanding of business because your background is as an entrepreneur. You've built companies, and so you get that it's not just about the front end tax saving. There's also a whole raft of other things that happen on the back end of a business that are equally important, if not more important sometimes. Um, that's one of the real things that that really struck me and made me kind of follow along and uh, take my advice from you. It's that understanding at a more holistic level about what actually happens. Because if you go on YouTube and just start talking about LLCs in the in the States, it's all Delaware, it's all Wyoming, that's where you need to be. There's there's the transparency is there. It's good for, good for you, do that, don't worry about it. But without actually realizing there's a whole raft of problems that that, that lack of transparency can, can create for a business, particularly when you're overseas. And I appreciate that. I'll tell you, you know, I have a friend uh, who has, uh, I don't know if it's his quote or he's adapted it, but he says, everything is easy and nothing is easy, right? You know, he, this is a guy, he lost 35 kilos before I met him. And so, and everyone said, well, wow, was that easy? Everything's easy and nothing's easy, right? I mean, I, I did it. So apparently it's easy, but it's not like easy as in you just sit around and keep, keep eating ding-dongs and ho-hos and, and the weight falls off, right? You have to do something. And I think that that same kind of uh, approach applies here. And that's what I always try and remind myself is uh, when I'm explaining this stuff to people, there's certain things that I do. I mean, again, I'm not, you know, when, I, when I bought this property today, I've done a number of sight unseen purchases around the world because of, we've developed the whole infrastructure to do that. But the first time I did it, uh, I remember I buying a property overseas for $22,000. I had to go and pay in cash, physical cash that I took out of the bank. I walked a kilometer down the street and I had to pay at a notary, and it's like, holy cow, what if someone like, you know, kills me or something and takes the money? Uh, you know, so, um, you know, you can go on YouTube, and obviously we have 900 videos on YouTube where we try and discuss this stuff, but um, my fear is that some people make it too difficult, like it's impossible. Sometimes you go to your accountant, and your accountant says, no, 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 don't do that. And that's not true. You can do it. It's very possible. Other people, though, say, ah, oh, you know, my friend did this, and it's so easy. It is, yeah, I just set up in Delaware, and there'll be no problems. I've had people who've set up in Delaware, no problems, and then they stayed in Australia, and they actually doubled their, they actually made their taxes worse. So, because uh, of the way how U.S. LLCs are structured. So, uh, it's not impossible, nor should it just be set up in Delaware, and that's all there is to it. It's a holistic approach. I like that. Uh, so, folks, on the call, we're kind of coming to the end of our time. So, um, here's what I want you to do. Uh, I've put up on the screen a picture of Andrew's YouTube channel, Send to All. I've also posted a link to that in the chat. Do yourself a favor. Go and subscribe to Nomad Capitalist on YouTube. The information is outstanding. The amount of content, I literally don't know where Andrew gets the time to do it all, the amount of content, great research content that goes out, eight, 900 videos, something like that now, is just astounding. It's absolutely astounding. Go and subscribe. You will thank me. I watch every video religiously. It's been a massive, massive uh, education process for me to to get somebody who really understands it. And you know when you know when you talk to somebody and you know they really understand it, they can explain it really simply for you. That's what I like. I like that. It's a very complex topic. I get that, but it's explained really simply for you. And if you do want to get really geeky, then man, oh man, Andrew can get really geeky with you with it as well. But it's done in such a way that if you feel like you can grasp it, you feel like you can understand it. So do yourself a favor, go and subscribe to that. The other thing I'm going to suggest you do as well as a way of kind of introducing yourself into this is go check out the book. It's a really is a fantastic book. And the the thing that I think I personally got from that was this, this notion of diversity. There's so many different options out there for you. And it's great to know what, what they are. And the, the, I think the hidden meaning behind the book, for me at least, was not only go where you're treated best, but understand where you're trying to get to and then put your plan in place to get to that. That was a kind of hidden meaning for me and a bit more of a kind of 
personal development sort of fashion um, that really, really struck a chord with me. It's on Amazon. It's on Amazon Australia. It's like, you know, it's 11 bucks. Go and, go and buy the book. It is absolutely fantastic. And you'll get a real insight into how this stuff works at a very, very deep level. So go subscribe to a YouTube channel. Totally free. Go and get the book. 11 bucks, something like that. And then do yourself a favor as well. Go and get onto Andrew's mailing list. Uh, they're constantly putting out amazing content. I read something the other day about Malaysia. And Andrew's been talking about that at length. And I, I kind of took that, went to my wife and said, oh, we really ought to get over to Malaysia. Go and have to go and check it out. Go and see what chaos is all about. And it's just a really good way of opening your eyes to what else is out there. And as entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs in training, having that sense of what else is out there, it's kind of within our souls to do that. So I think you'll really enjoy it. Uh, Andrew, massive, massive thank you for spending some time with us tonight. I know you are ludicrously busy, so I really do appreciate you taking time out of your very busy schedule to spend some time with us uh, and for providing some great insights. Thanks so much for that. It's really appreciated, buddy. Hey, it's my pleasure. And I'll, if I may just add one more thing. Um, for the folks who are less video inclined, if they go to the nomadcapitalist.com, nomadcapitalist.com, even more articles, which I think you said you were you were reading some of them, uh, you can search through about 1,800 articles um, mm -hmm. that we've written since 2012. Um, and so some of them have the YouTube video embedded in there, but I know some folks like to read. Um, you can do that as well. But anyway, I do appreciate the invitation. I, very kind words and, and always uh, happy to be with you. Uh, folks, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for being a part of the Aussie Online Entrepreneurs. As I said, do yourself a favor, get yourself off to nomadcapitalist.com, go subscribe. Also get yourself onto his YouTube channel. I'm gonna bring up the book as, again as well. The book has the name of the company, Nomad Capitalist. Fantastic read, you'll really, really like it. It will be instrumental in your thinking about planning out your life going forward. If you read it, it's one of those kind of life-changing books. That, I mean, I'm in Portugal. It doesn't get more life-changing than that. Um, I think you'll really get a lot out of it. I really recommend it. Andrew, thanks again, buddy. It's been a pleasure to have you on the call, to get your insights into what's happening, not only within Australia, but also you know, right around the world as well. It's been absolutely fantastic, mate. We really appreciate that.